What's up, guys? Coming at you with another episode of Tampa Bay Real Producers, which is the podcast for real producers, by real producers, and of course, with real producers. And today we have none other than Mr. Bill Parker, who is a real producer himself, as you can see, featured in our April 2020, 20, uh, 2020, 2020, 20, uh, issue here. You can see Cool Shades Bill right there. That's a nice picture, my man. Uh, right there by the boats and telling his story about building his team. And we're going to dive into that right now. So, Bill, it's good to have you here, brother. Thanks, Don. I appreciate you having me. How you doing today? Doing awesome, man. Ready to rock and roll? Absolutely. So we typically get started just to kind of tell some of the uh, viewers about your background and, and how you got into the Tampa real estate market. So did you grow up around here? You're from another neck of the woods. Uh, how, we'll start there. Grew up in the Dallas, Texas area. I uh, can't give credit to any one place. I was all around. So grew up in the Dallas, Dallas metro area. Um, small town outside of there. Spent most of my time Gun Barrel City. Kind of a fun fact. Nice. Uh, yeah, Gun Barrel City. So anyway, with that being said, grew up there about 18. Took I wonder off how the they road. got that name, huh? <laughs> <laughs> You figure it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a straight road through town. They call it a gun barrel. That's <laughs> I like actually it. how it got. There. Makes sense. So anyway, with that being said, moved out of Texas about 18, went off to New York, played soccer, uh, bounced around chasing dreams, ended up back in Texas, wanted out, went to Colorado, I uh, went to school, took a job in the corporate world and retail management, and then ended up in Grand Junction, met a girl, got married. Fast forward a few years, a few kids. We're in Salt Lake. Uh, I'm in a corporate role running a five-state territory. Uh, middle management guy, right, a regional guy. And so uh, when the furloughs come, I'm the first to go because yep. I'm an extra layer. So that led me to get my real estate license and eventually join a, a big team there in Utah that taught me a lot about real estate. Nice. And then, um, you know, What year was forward. this now? Yeah, I mean, by the time I got my license was 2014. Okay. Um, you know, I did And you were up. in the uh, retail corporate world prior for how long? You know, retail corporate world prior, and then that transitioned to an outside sales management role. So I was a, a business development manager. I was a hunter specifically gotcha. and, and a farmer at one point where I had a territory I managed, plus I was hunting new business. And then that turned into, you know, a leadership role over over other uh, adjacent categories and compliance, compliance and pricing and, and legal and so on. So Put that's where the contracts. sales skills came in, huh? Right. Putting together it was an outside sales role with some, with, some, uh, with some management responsibilities, basically a CEO of a territory type thing, a five-state gotcha. territory. So, um, so the retail was really where I learned to grind. And then, and then the outside sales is where I developed those, those extra skills I needed to transition to real estate. So yep. 14, I was laid off. I go to work in real estate. I stunk. Uh, I did a couple of deals, took me a while, and I realized I needed a mentor, which is a big part of my whole story. So no doubt. I found a great mentor. He taught me a lot. He put me in his passenger seat for six months. We did like 35 deals, all listings. I was a listing agent. I was really fortunate. Um, and so with that being said, I, I took those skills and started uh, putting those to work. And uh, did a great job with my corporate job, did this part-time after they brought me back like they always do, right? We're losing yeah. business. We need you back. So they did that. I came back, uh, but it wasn't enough. And so I started doing real estate more as like wanting to be an investor. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I'd been on the team. I jumped off the team to go back to a corporate job, but I'm still using my real estate license where I can. And so that helped me build up some extra um, reserves and things like that. So I had this idea I was going to transition out. We'd been living in the Rocky Mountains. It was cold. You know, I mean, we loved it, but... Uh, that was where my career was, was the reason we stayed so the long. Sunshine was calling you. Sunshine was calling. We used to uh, vacation to Dunedin every year, uh, several times a year. And so we had some in-laws there. My daughter would spend summers. Anyway, Dunedin was a no-brainer. Yeah. So uh, 2018, I decide, I call my boss right before my 45th birthday, and I'm like, hey, man, I can't do this anymore. He's like, do what? You don't really do anything. Um, you just... <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, <have> relationships. <laughs> yeah. He's like, you're not real. I mean, you know, you work from home, you have this territory that's by all the national parks, you travel around. I know where you stay. I see your, your hotel bills. I know yep. where you're, I'm like, yeah, it's a wonderful thing. But like, I just, I, you know, if you don't burn the bridge, you're never really going to, you know, go get it. Right. No so that was just resonating with me. Somebody had said that you have to burn the bridge. And I was like, I do. Because mm -hmm. as long as I have this comfort zone, this this uh, this extra support, I'm not ever going to burn the bridge and go for my real dreams and become yep. you know who I want to be. That's a huge point. A lot yeah. of people who might even hear this probably are dabbling with real estate right now, right? Some of yeah. them are still have, holding on to that job, uh, or are you know uh, afraid uh, to be able to even consider going full time into real estate because you don't have that safety net, right, of knowing what that's going to look like. And so I'm sure that wasn't. You know, it's easy for us to talk about it now, but at the time, that might not, that, I'm sure that wasn't an easy decision for you. It's something you probably slept through a couple of nights, right? Maybe five years. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, five years worth of sleepless nights making this decision. Uh, I was at a different stage in my life. I could have made the decision a lot easier now that I know what I know. Mm. Um, so I just encourage people not to wait. 
you know, make the yeah. decision now and just move forward with it. There's a, there's a compound effect that happens over time. So the quicker you get in the game, the faster you get to your goals. No doubt. And so for me, it was just one of these things where I was, I was about to turn 45. I was like eight days away from 45 years old. I had a sophomore in high school and one that just literally graduated at 17. And, uh, and the 17 year old was a stick in the mud. He wasn't going anywhere while he's in high school. So we got him set up with college. He's here at USF. But, uh, anyway, the daughter was like, let's go buy me a red Jeep. Let's move to Florida. I'm like, sweet. So nice. 10th grade, we move her. She finished high school here, her junior and senior year. So 2018, we transitioned, uh, to Florida. And that's what brought us here was family sunshine. My daughter loves it. And, uh, and you moved so, to Dunedin. Yeah, we moved to Dunedin and uh, no, truthfully, we moved to Palm Harbor that year because our daughter was in high school. She wanted to go to PHU. She already had a couple friends she knew there. Okay. And and we just, we liked PHU. It seemed like a good fit. Gotcha. So she went to uh, Palm Harbor University High School and then we moved into Dunedin as soon as she was a senior and we knew that we didn't need the, the Palm Harbor address anymore. Makes sense. Yeah. I want to back up for just a second. So what was it that appealed to, uh, uh, what was it about real estate that was appealing to you that made you select that route? Um it didn't sound like you had a like a background necessarily in real estate, but somehow you got connected with that Salt Lake team. So how did that dynamic happen? Well, how, why you know why did you go down that, that uh, direction? Yeah, interesting you ask. So my grandmother was a realtor for thirty years, and uh, she was an investor, real estate investor, and so she was planting seeds unintentionally, but she was planting seeds, mm. and she didn't know it. And so I had a really blue collar, uh, and, and and I love that about my family. Very blue collar, uh, hardworking. Um, you know, get out of high school, go get a good job and keep it. You know, my, my grandfather had two pensions, you know what I mean? Like they're those people, yep. 140 salt acres, of the earth type people, salt of the earth, 140 acres, still farmed it, had cattle. I mean, you name it. They, they, you know, so I had this background with my grandmother who was a very, uh, you know, simple in a good way type salt of the earth person who had done well through just understanding real estate. She never made a bunch of money at real estate. Mm -hmm but she learned how to invest in real estate. Mm -hmm. And so it gave her a life that allowed her to have enough passive income, not to mention, you know, Pop had a couple of pensions, but she had a passive income in her retirement that when she had her cardiac arrest at 55, she was able to quit working. Mm. She had to, she couldn't really do it. And teams weren't a thing yet. There weren't even buyers yet before 87, I think buyers mm -hmm. agents, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So she's a listing agent. She couldn't, you know, they're using a book. She can't get around. She's in a small town they don't have assistants and uh, directors of operations and sales and everything, you know, buyers, all these things at this time. So she had her friends helping her get through it. Cause after the cardiac arrest, she had lost, you know, her, her abilities, her cognitive abilities. She didn't remember these things. So I remember thinking that this gives you a way to get to a place where you can retire. If you don't have the pension or the for, you know, whatever it is, sure. some sort of formal retirement. So it was kind of like a way that I saw at 45, I'd built a decent little nest egg and everything, but I wanted more. And I saw real estate being the opportunity, uh, because I could learn more about investing if I'm doing this daily. So that was my focus, right? That's cool. But what happened is I'm standing on the sideline. I was coaching a youth football game. I was head coach for my son many years. And, uh, and so I'm coaching a youth football game and I, you know, get off the field and I'm walking away and I'm talking. And one of my buddies is a, who's a father of one of the players is like, Hey man, you ever thought about getting in real estate? And I'm like, we just lost dude. <laughs> I'm thinking talking? about winning the next year. Yeah, game. man. Like, <laughs> <laughs> already doing review on the next film, you know, like what the heck? I'm like, he got my attention though. So that, that evolved. Cool. And he was on the sideline in my ear chirping and he owned a small brokerage. It was a mom and pop, two guys, him and his brother, you okay. know, the mortgage business as well. This guy's killed it, crushed it. You know, he's like, yeah, I've already bought the nine 11s. I've already made the million bucks. I'm just kind of on that next phase. Yep. I'm like great mentor. Mm -hmm. Right. I jump in. That's when I told you I stunk. I did two deals. There wasn't, and no fault of his. So when you first jumped in, you were on your own. I went with him. I went with this. You little, went with him right away. Okay. Yeah, it was a two person, <clears throat> two, two gentlemen that ran a brokerage. Got you. And they crushed it, but there was no support. Yep. He's like, yeah, create a squeeze page, put them in your CRM, nurture them. You'll do 50 deals a year. Right. Okay. Sounds good. Can yeah. You, can Simple. you repeat what a squeeze page is again? Yeah. Right. <laughs> is, where's a squeeze page? How does that work? Like yeah. Lemons or oranges? <laughs> <Right>. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you ended up, uh, so then it was a different mentor that got you to the next level or is that the same team? Yeah. So what happened, that was when I was first laid off. I had gone and got this real estate license because of the buddy on the sideline and uh, I was working in his brokerage. I, I sold two homes. Like I said, it was my mother yep. and it was some piece of land up the Is that your first year, two homes? Yeah. Yeah. I was still employed yep. with my job, thank yep. God. But that's why I knew I had to burn the bridge because I wasn't doing what I needed to do to become a good realtor or agent. And I knew that I had the ability. I knew I had the talent, but I learned quickly talent alone wasn't enough. Yeah, no doubt. So yes. So fast forward just a little bit there and I had been laid off again and I went back 
to this uh, this idea of becoming a realtor, and I start Googling who's the biggest, baddest realtor in town, and it, it kept coming up. So I went and knocked on his door and said, look, I want to work for you. I want to learn. I'm, you know, I'm ready to go. And, and he did the whole process, and he hired me, and he said he just lost his listing agent of eight years, and she, uh, she had decided to go on maternity leave. She had children that she wanted to go raise. And, um, and so I was fortunate enough. I got to sit in his passenger seat, like I That's said, awesome. six months. Yeah. So when you went full time <clears throat> into real estate, that was in Salt Lake at first, that was right? In Salt Lake. Yeah. Like 2016. What did that, and was that your, was that your breakthrough year that, that first year no. going full time? It was not on the team. I did like 35 transactions, but I don't, try to take credit for that production, right? So it was mm -hmm. a lot of uh, stuff being put on a tee and I just had to convert and close. Yep. And I had a lot of administrative support. It's a big team. They do four or 500 deals a year uh, right now. So um, the the first year I jumped off his team, I only did five, mm -hmm. okay? But I was still employed. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I did five and then I did, you know, 12 and then I did 18, yep. I think. I did six or seven million by the time I exited Utah in 2018. Uh, and my last year. Okay. So that was your break. That was your biggest year there. Yeah. About right? 7 million. Yeah. Gotcha. And so the reason why I think it's interesting diving into some of these details is because there are people again, who listen to the episodes and sometimes they, they can't see the vision. They can't, they can't see what next year might look like for them. And so, you know, seeing how you had this progression, right. That it yeah. wasn't just, Hey, I'm now an agent. I'm going to go do 50 deals a year. It, it wasn't that automatic. You built something that now is producing at really good levels. I mean, you know, I don't know if we threw the numbers out there, but Bill did over 19 million, you know, this past year, over 50, over 50 transactions. Really. I think most of that was all just driven by you. I know you have a couple people working with you too, uh, on your team. And so you could see that it's about figuring out how to be able to put these systems together so you can make that pop year happen. Now, fast forwarding a little bit, you come to Florida. Um, now you're, uh, you're obviously getting hooked up here in the Florida market. So um, tell us a little bit more about that, how you got started here in Tampa Bay. Yeah. So 2018, we show up, um, you know, pocket full of money, ready to go. I buy a boat. We spend almost a year on Three Rooker Island, but I'm getting my real estate license and networking with people. Didn't do any real estate, uh, really. Um, I want to say, and forgive me, I should have looked a little closer before I came in. I believe it was, I believe it was May 2019 was my first production okay. year. So let's just say that. And then, uh, you know, truth is it could have been May 2018. I'd have to look. But anyway, it was a small year and that led up to 2020. Yep. Okay. So I came here, not much of a network. I start networking and I start building a small database and I start building a brand. Yep. And, I and this is only like four years ago. So it's not like it's true too, that long. I mean, you know, you no. can see the progression in a short period of time, really, uh, you know, over the last couple of years and how it's grown for you. Was it KW that you hooked up with right away? Uh, immediately I hooked up with KW because I had been there in Utah Gotcha. and I found a great mentor in Troy Walseth when I moved here. So I joined his team briefly. Shout out to Troy. What's Love up, him. Troy? He's a good boy. <laughs> He's an awesome guy. Yeah, He'll be on our guy. podcast some one of these days community. here. We've featured him in a, in an issue before. Yeah. Good dude. Mm -hmm. Uh, so anyway, he, you know, took me under his wing, taught me a lot about the Florida contract. I'm, I'm big on the contract. Like that's one of the differentiators for me. Uh, so anyway, uh, you know, Troy, Troy taught me a lot about Florida real estate. He's obviously seasoned here. And, uh, but the drive to St. Pete was so much for me coming from Dunedin every day, going back and forth, running out. I was a listing agent for him as well. Thank goodness. But running out to an appointment at seven after I'd already been down there all day, trying to go back and forth. Yep. Um, so I left KW because I wanted to be right on main street in Dunedin. I had, I had established who I was as a person. I needed a brand to match that. Mm -hmm. So I went and found a brokerage on main street in Dunedin, um, spent a little time at two brokerages on Main Street in Dunedin. Things kept shifting. One of them lost their location, so I went to another one. And then I went there, and it wasn't a cultural fit, which nothing against them. It just wasn't for me. And then... They still have that coastal one there, right? Right in downtown? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know yeah, that good one Good people, well. good yep. brand. Uh, but anyway, so so I decide to move to the uh, local KW because I, I hooked up with another great guy that's a real producer, Bobby Polini, who was there at the time. Oh, tie Bobby. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> We're shouting out everybody, everybody here today. Everybody today. I got, a, I got a bunch more, man. So anyway, Bowtie Bobby, you know, he's working for KW at the time, hits me up, and I said, yeah, man, I miss it. I, I, it was fun. It was good. It, it was a good fit for me. And I know yeah. not everybody, it's not the right fit. But for me, it was a great fit. I was looking to build a team. They have lots of layers of support and, and training and, and extras for teams, right? It's focused around that. And so, uh, you know, he, he kind of nurtured me along for a few months while I'm doing my thing on Main Street. And he's like, look, I got an idea. 
And so we started talking and it led to me opening an expansion office in Dunedin. Okay. So KW has a program, not to, not to try to plug my own program. Here, plug away. Yeah, man. I mean, you know, so KW allows you to open expansion offices if you re reach a certain level. They call it a mega, you know, mega, mega agent, yeah. which I think every real producer would qualify. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, with that being said, they allowed me to open a location in an unawarded territory is what we call it. And so I'm an independent uh, expansion office. Very and cool. So when did I, you open that? <laughs> dates i'm not my thing uh 20 uh 20 ish okay so just a couple yeah, years ago give me probably the back half of 2020 i was crushing it 2020 i was paying a ton to non-capping situations yeah and so i wanted to bring some of that money back in house i think i paid for both of my kids college in four months and so i was like man i got to bring that money back in house i'm going to get profitable i'm going to reduce cost of sales so i wanted a capping environment but i wanted all the layers of support technology etc that you get so i partnered up with them and i opened the expansion office i dropped my google pin drop i started building reviews i doubled that up by doing the same thing on Zillow becoming a true Dunedin agent, being recognized as a Dunedin agent. Yep. And uh, with such an influx of, of people from out of town, you know, when they come in, I am absolutely to them the expert. So building that brand around that hyper local niche was, was important. I love that. Yeah. We actually are going to run a panel, by the way. Uh, you know how we do the panels at Whiskey Cake? And yeah, I think it's them. in July, and one, the topic is on dominating the local niche or the local brand. So maybe we can have you on as a panelist if that would work, because I think the story that you're t telling now is something I would love to be able to flush in a little deeper during that panel and, and see if we can you know, educate some people on how to do that. I'd love it, Doug. Uh, I think that would be cool. So um, so you're, you're in Dunedin. Building up your uh, your brand there in the Dunedin market, uh, decided that was kind of the, the base that you wanted to kind of build something with. Were you always under the mindset that you wanted to build a team from the get go? Was that always kind of the vision as far as the real estate thing, or did that evolve? Yeah, you know, I mean, I joined a great team, so I knew what good looked like, and I thought, yeah, that's what I want to do, right? I want to do a hundred million dollars a year and this, that, and the other, and. It does evolve, so I don't know if that's exactly what I want anymore. Um, I admire that. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, we've, we've already mentioned some people that are on $100 million sure. teams. I mean, it's amazing, and I know it's possible in our market. Yep. I see people doing it. Uh, but for me, it evolved into I wanted my life, man. I spent 25 years in corporate, and I've been coaching and everything else. So the coaching piece was huge to me. I, I love investing in others. I love inspiring others. I love to motivate them. I, I enjoy all that of the coaching piece. So I know I want to continue to coach and mentor and guide others. I like the team environment. I would like to build another team, but I'm going to let that team evolve organically and I'm going to quit forcing it. Yep. I think a lot of us believe because if somebody else did it, that we should. Sure. And my, I, I, you know, I have a, I have a coach. You all got to blaze most, your own path. <clears throat> yeah. Most of us have a coach and my coach has been asking some really good questions of me lately. And he's like, you know, just making me dig deep. And so what I would say is, is just, you know, make sure you're asking yourself the right questions. Mm. And if the answer is still yes, then yes, you still want a team. And this is what you want from that team. But for me, I think I'm a highly competitive guy. I think a lot of us are um, trying to get a little bit away from that for good reason, because, you know, it can lead you down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. And so, um, being highly competitive, you know, I want to beat the hundred million dollar team. I want to be number one. I want to, you know, that's just the way I think we're wired. But what I'm also realizing is I want to live my life by design. Yeah. So if I can organically create this team and it leads me to a hundred million dollar team and I have my life by design. Yes. That's what I want. Yep. If I can have it all, but you don't want to sacrifice the design for the, for the numbers. I, that I makes won't sense. sacrifice the design for the numbers. Yeah, no, I think it's awesome. And I think yeah. it's smart to start first with what's that lifestyle design and have clarity on what that looks like. Yes. You mentioned your coach. And I, again, I think that's something that comes up a lot <clears throat> in these episodes is the importance of a mentor. Absolutely. Um, the importance of having a coach. Uh, I'm curious, give us uh, some wisdom on some of the questions that you and your coach, that your coach has been asking you that's been helping you get that clarity Maybe there's something that can help some of the listeners in terms of helping them put that vision together for themselves. Man, uh, Brent is Brent is incredible. He's deep. So when he asks me questions, they're not usually like, what's your goal for this week? I mean, I have that kind of accountability partner as well sure. that we do a one-on-one -on -one and I have to you know hit my goals. But Brent was supposed to be that guy. And what happened is he and I both love reading. And so we start digging deep into books like Power of Vulnerability and The Tools and... Uh, I mean, just some amazing books that make you look inside, right? They, no doubt. Yeah, so they make you reflect. They make you really question uh, what's important in life. And I actually, because I don't want to butcher this, you know, I had Brent text this to me because he asked me this question the other day. 
he said, um, so do you understand the definition of fate versus destiny? And I'm like, well, I mean, sure, yeah, I have Merriam-Webster, sure. So he said, <laughs> okay, well, I, let me just throw out at you what I'm kind of getting from some of my reading and so on in these books and everything. He said, fate is kind of just what will happen, right? Fate's what happens. And he said, destiny is the ultimate path for the individual when the right questions are asked. Mm. So some of these questions he's asking me are like, um, you know, do you ever look down at the end of the road and talk to, you know, you can call it whatever you want, yourself, God. I, I'm not here to define who you're talking to, but think about who you're trying to become. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're trying to become more like someone or something or who you want, want to be, um, it's important to go down the road and talk to that person. And he's like, are you talking to them? And I was trying to make a huge decision I shared with you in private recently about whether I take my team this direction or if I go a different direction and help build someone else's team, a bigger team. Yep. Right? So I decided to stay on my own path, but I actually went back to my coach and said, Hey man, I, I talked to that guy down the road, that old guy, that old me down the road. And I said, he, he told me I should do this. And he goes, are you sure you talked to the right guy? I'm mm-hmm. like, dude, <laughs> like, come on, man. You're telling me go talk to this guy that I don't know. I go talk to him. Then you're like, I think you found the wrong guy. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't get it, man. Sounds like a it. true sage of a coach though. I could tell you right. that. He's good. <clears throat> He's good. So he just makes you think. And the funny thing is he wasn't telling me I was talking to the right guy, right guy or wrong guy. He's making sure. Yeah. He's asking the right questions. And that's what this is about is when the right questions are asked, you know, that's your ultimate path for that individual if you answer those questions correctly. So, you know, that's a big part of it. And then uh, ultimately, what's my vision? And he asked me, he said, are you willing, is it worth it for you to give up everything you're going to give up and sacrifice to have that $100 million team that you and I are trying to build together? And I said, I don't know. Mm. I don't know, because at 50, uh, you know, at any age, you're not guaranteed tomorrow. And so like you're just looking at this going and then you have reality hit you in the face. You lose loved ones, whatever. And that, you know, that's been a that's been something recent for me. And so it's like I'm looking at all these things thinking, you know, my wife would probably like a husband. Yeah. My kids, you know, I asked them, what's the five most. uh, What do you think people would say? You know, you know, the whole give me five words that describe your dad. Yeah. You know, first one came out of their mouth was workaholic. I mean, is that who you want to be remembered? It's as probably dad? not a good thing. Yeah. No. And then of course, you know, number two, three, four, and five is all these other amazing things they say about their father, right? Because I love them and they love me and they know that. But the truth is I've led with my business being first and you know, there's, you know, not to get off on a tangent here and not to plug KW, but God, family, then business in that order. And I'm trying to get that reorganized, right? I think I having those humble beginnings and being a competitive guy, like I said, that'll drive you in the wrong direction. So I think I was chasing trophies and just trying to amass zeros at the end of the bank account and number one awards for, you know, whatever else. And Dude, I love that. Get myself in an issue of Tampa Bay Real Producers That's was right. a goal. You know We're here I mean? to stroke that ego, aren't we? You know, <laughs> hey, I got one for you. Ego can be your number one asset or your most expensive line item on your p l yeah no doubt and i'm trying to get it off my p l i love it man that's a lot of wisdom that you just dropped out there i hope people really able to really internalize that because if you can if you can take what bill just said to heart it's life-changing right in terms it's of really for me identifying the priorities that are really going to fuel your activities on a daily basis and yeah god there's so many people out there who like chase the trophies and yes. chase the numbers and chase what they think success is and then in some cases they actually attain it and then realize that they're miserable, you know, throughout the process and they've lost loved ones along the way and they don't have a relationship with their kids along the way. And it's like, what was I do- doing all this for? Right. And, yeah. and the idea yeah. of having real clarity on what's most important. And of course your business is always going to be important. No one's saying that it shouldn't be, but doing it for the reasons to fuel the lifestyle that you want rather than business being the lifestyle that you, that you have, I think there's a lot, uh, there's, there's a big difference there. And, and that distinction sounds like it's something you've really come to grips with. And, yeah. um, you know, it, there's fulfillment in that life. And, and I'm, I'm just happy for you that you've been able to find that and that you're continuing to seems like thrive in that space. Yeah. So, um, God bless you. Thank you, man. Um, one of the things I think that we tend to learn a lot from are some of the challenges and some of the lessons that I think we learn. And we've talked a little bit, maybe just with what you just said about how you've learned some lessons through some of, some of the coaching that you've had. But um, if you had to think through, like, what are some some of the big takeaways maybe since uh, maybe just the last few years as you've been in this journey of building your Dunedin organization and building your brand in Dunedin, uh, what are some of the challenges that you face and how you what you've learned from them, how you've overcome some of them? Anything come to mind? <laughs> yeah. So many. Um, I mean, authenticity is key. That's probably the biggest thing I've learned. We talk about 
chasing trophies. We talk about ego. This is all the same stuff, right? So just kind of perfect segue to be who you are. Don't try to be somebody you're not. You know, uh, I think we mentioned two gentlemen earlier that are total opposites with huge success and I'm different than them and I'm doing okay too. And yep. you look at all these other real producers, you know, some of them are dressed fancy. Some of them are dressed different. You know, you got all these different personalities and they're all able to be successful when they just start identifying with who they are and they honor that. Yep. So just be okay with who you are, be authentic and you'll attract the right people and they'll stay. And that's key because we talk about attrition on our teams. We talk about you know, what's the culture? What's this? What's that? You know, and I loved it. Borum said money. <laughs> it's not wrong, right? Mm-hmm. That's what keeps people. When I didn't want to leave corporate, it was for a check, mm-hmm. right? So when you build the culture around, let's go make money together and build a life by design. And then you honor that and you're putting God, family, then business or whatever your values are in mm-hmm. that order. Uh, you know, I think all of a sudden you realize the stickiness happens, the, the people that want to refer you and all that. They're just, they're, they're now your, your, your group. Right? Yep. They're your people. And so it's like this, this uh, group energy, you know, power comes in numbers, I used to say. And it's like this massive energy of people moving together, right? When you start acting like yourself and attracting people who like who you are for who you are, it just becomes really natural and easy. And all of a sudden you just start building and it happens. So the biggest thing I found was take off the suit and tie, quit acting like somebody you're not, just go be yourself, be authentic, and then just Honestly, man, every morning, same prayer, be, you know, be patient, be kind, be loving, be a beacon of light and pour into others. Like it's real simple, yeah, right? Real simple. So I've just learned that, uh, that for me, it's about coming from contribution, doing the right things and attracting the right people. Yeah. I think the idea of being authentic is something that sometimes, especially people who are trying to build their real estate business, they look at the most successful real producers yeah. and they think, well, I have to be like that person in order to have their success. Right. Yeah. And it's somewhat natural to try to replicate somebody who is successful and there's nothing necessarily wrong in that. But I think what you said has a lot of power too. It's if you're really going to be truly successful and I'm not even just talking about the numbers, successful meaning fulfilled, Right. You can't do that if you're not authentic to who you are, right, as yourself. And you're probably going to get more production as well if you are authentic and you start with that mindset first. So that way you can actually have those genuine connections with your clients, with your teammates, with the people in your brokerage, with the people that are in your community. It all starts really with like kind of being true to yourself and knowing, who, you know, and what that means for you. And I think... Then, of course, having that be part of your daily habits in some way, daily routines, which you started mentioning a little bit there with the, the daily prayers and, and just making sure you're, uh, yeah. your head's right, your mentality's in a good space and all that Absolutely. fun stuff. Um, yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the personal side. You already mentioned that you're, you're, um, you're married. Uh, how long have you been married now? Yeah, since 99. So what is it? 99. 20 three years forgive and me 20. and you have two two kids <laughs> was terrible. it uh yeah we have two children yeah uh, my wife libby who is is absolutely my everything she i think i met libby right at the event right for me you know what i mean yeah. she's anything i need she's also an accountant but she's at home making sure my business is good because we're in search of a new ea uh you did meet libby she's the life of the party she's yeah. a lot of fun yeah she's a she's a she's a neat lady yeah. And then, and then we then have you're, two you're, children. Yeah. You're two that are right now getting to that age of graduating school soon, huh? Yeah. 22 year old David, uh, love him to death. He's a super cool kid, smart kid. He goes to USF. He's graduating. Uh, he just finished finals up. He's got two more in the summer, two more classes or something in the summer. Nice. And then he graduates with his accounting degree. He's headed back to Utah where we moved him from. He prefers cold weather and his group of friends there. So he's headed back. He'll get his master's up there in finance. It sounds like probably going banking or, or something like that. What do you guys like to do for fun in the Dunedin area? There's, I love Dunedin, by the way. It's a great town. Well, I take and the I, family and I there my sometimes. daughter. I don't want to miss her. Love, love <laughs> my daughter. She's amazing. She's already moved back to Utah. She's engaged. We just closed on her first home. I'm licensed in Utah. We just closed on her first home uh, last week. Nice. Uh, in Orem, Utah. That's and a so big her win. And her fiance are getting married September 2nd. We love him today. He's amazing. Connor. Uh, so that's actually uh, Connor my anniversary Peyton. date, September 2nd. September 2nd. That's nice. it, man. Yeah. Nice. Uh, yeah, that's cool, man. That's uh, It's a good time of year. Where's the wedding going to be? Utah? Utah. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So we're flying a bunch. We've kind of about 16 of us have migrated here from the Rockies, right? So we're all flying back up for that. And then we'll have a huge, he's got a big family. Salt Lake? There. Yeah, it's in just south of Salt Lake, Provo, Orem area. Sure, It'll be I in Linden, Provo. Utah is where the wedding is. It's at Walker Farms. It's super cool. I have a solar team that I think I told you about That's at one right. point, And their headquarters is in Provo. Yes, yes. Lumio. Is yeah, their, Lumio. Absolutely. Yeah, their great, headquarters great, are right great, there. Great, great group. Yes. Yeah, excellent absolutely. People. So it's a yep. beautiful area too. The mountains are gorgeous out there. I was out there 
I guess about a year ago now, but man, it was brick cold. It was like t- 10 degrees and, yeah. and windy and yeah, but yeah, it, it so was gorgeous, but here. cold. Yeah, exactly. You asked, I can, I understand. You know. Well, I'm from Connecticut, <laughs> so I understand the motivation uh, to yeah. get out of the cold weather for yeah, sure. But for yeah, sure. it's beautiful. Well, congrats on the, uh, the expansion of the family, man. That's awesome. Yeah, we're excited. Good times. Yeah. So um, you were saying what other things you guys do for fun in the Dunedin area? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, my wife and I are kind of homebodies, but we eat out almost every single day. So I write a little food blog, little drink blog. I highlight, you know, yesterday was a coffee shop. Last night was a brewery. The day before was a restaurant. So I try to pour back into that. So you're a foodie, huh? Yeah, man. So I was talking about my grandmother who inspired me as a realtor. Uh, so my mom is in the food service industry. And so she's she's been everything from, you know, a waitress all the way to, you know, whatever, kitchen manager or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. So she's worked in kitchens and, and around the food service industry her whole life, raised me, you know, uh, not single-handedly, but was a big, big part of my upbringing and, and, and did a lot for me and worked hard. She's, she's, the, she's the example I had for just incredible work ethic. And she's still, she's almost 70. She still works like that every day by choice. She doesn't necessarily have to but God she bless does. her yeah and so she's just the hardest working person I know so she's in the food service industry I saw the struggle she had being a waitress on tips and things as a kid coming up and having to pay daycare blah 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 right so my heart goes out to that so in 2020 I'm downtown Dunedin I'm selling real estate making good money and I'm watching my friends in the food and restaurant industry who feed me every day struggle you know some of them were doing okay but a lot of them you know they were shut down right mm-hmm. so they were having to change their business model and so you know, I'd go to these little restaurants every day and the owners are in these places and done eating a lot of the time. So mm-hmm. I created some criteria and I said, Hey man, I just want to get your, your word out. I've got this little, uh, blog I write. And so we kind of formalized it. We've got a name for it, all that stuff, website, Facebook page, all that. And so we start doing these interviews. Um, I was on the other side of this and doing these things with these restaurant owners and just the stories are amazing. I'm sure you find yeah, this with people too. I love that. So I just fell in love with it. And I used to like to write and call, you know, like yeah. college age, I'd do some writing courses and stuff. I love it. So I started doing that. It's also it became, smart by the way, as a, as an agent, uh, create a hyper local <laughs> niche. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that, so that, that that's a tip right there. Right. I mean, yeah. it was on purpose. I, yeah. So anyway, Talk with about all that adding said, value to your community, you know, amen. So come from contribution, do mm-hmm. something you love. Right. So these were easy for me. And then, and then pour into people was another thing I said. So those three things all, when I started asking the right questions, it was easy to know, right. this blog made sense. Yep. And so, I mean, it's not dollar driven, but it is dollar productive. Of course. So, okay. So that became something important to me and that led to this fancy for bourbon. And I now have a very good palate and have, I have a high end, stupid, ridiculous bourbon collection. <laughs> I have two boxers. I uh, love them dude. dearly. Yeah. We're going to have to hang out on a Friday night, huh? Brother. Yes. (laughs) Or afternoon. Yeah. (laughs) Whatever you want to do. Morning, whatever it needs, whatever it calls. After breakfast, sir. After (laughs) breakfast. Uh, But anyway, with that being said, yeah, crazy bourbon. What's your favorite kind of bourbon? Man, favorite kind of bourbon? You have one? Yeah. That kind in a bottle is my favorite. (laughs) No, man. I'll tell you what. I've got some crazy stuff. I've got Pappy. I've got Elmer T. Lee hundred year tribute. I've got, you know, okay. So I have a bottle of Warehouse C, E.H. Taylor. That's ridiculous, uh, ridiculously hard to find. And I know know the real bourbon aficionados are going to go, oh, he bought it secondary. I don't really care. So whatever. I've got it. And so. You bourbon uh, snobs. Just give him a a break, huh? Give me a break. Allow for grace. (laughs) Yes. I paid too much for it. So, but I don't do that all the time. Uh, I've got buddies that are also a part of this. We'll buy really high-end bottles together. We don't really care if it costs a little much. We want the experience. But I've never, ever, ever been so impressed with something as William LaRue Weller. It's incredible. Uh, it's an amazing uh, bottle. And then, uh, you know, just a one-off on something. Local distillers, seventh generation, Stephen Beam and Safety Harbor. Shout out, Stephen. Nice. And my, and my buddies at Neat Freaks. Uh, yeah, cool people I hang out with that teach me a lot about bourbon as well. And uh, anyway, Stephen has a bottle of Yellowstone that is off the charts, go get it. Sunshine liquor. I, I don't. I don't have. I'm not a bourbon uh, aficionado, as you can tell. But I don't know any of these brands that you're throwing out there oh, right now. But they I all, in my head, sound very tasty. So uh, I have, yeah. we'll have to we'll have to try it out. At least one yeah. of them sometime. Yeah, one or one. Sounds good, man. <laughs> um, a couple of like rapid fire things, just again on the personal side, just to see a couple of your favorites, and then we'll kind of wrap up here with uh, what I call our legacy question, which I think yeah. is a, a cool way to and it ties into a lot of what we've been yeah. talking today. Um, do you have a favorite? I know you talked about books. And by the way, one shout out I wanted to mention was one of my favorite books about the power of questions is a book called Fierce Conversations. I've read it just read yeah, it recently. It's a really good book about just the, the power of questions, you know, and, and how to make sure every conversation, you know, hopefully leads into something meaningful. And so that's a great, a great book to check out. Absolutely. We try to throw out some book suggestions every single episode. Um, do you have a favorite book or author or maybe even a seminar that you've attended that's made a big impact on you? 
and I can just, this is where I can go. I've read 12 books this year, right? So I'm, mm -hmm. I devour them. I love them. I'm I, mean, I do a lot on Audible. Too, Don't let that. me lie. I do a lot on Audible, but I'll also read. I need that, that piece, that therapeutic piece. So, How about a favorite book just this year then of the 12? <sighs> yeah, let's go this year. Um, I've read one thing again. I love that. One of my favorites, but The Tools by Phil Stutz. And there's also a two hour documentary on, uh, it's Jonah uh, Hill, uh, the comedian. Yeah. And his psychotherapist. Uh, Phil Stutz and the documentary on Netflix, if it's still available, is called Stutz, S T U T Z, but, uh, like the last name. Nice. Uh, it's a two hour uh, brief on what the book's going to dive into. And then The Tools is the name of the book by Phil Stutz. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. It's entertaining and uh, it's it's some great stuff for life skills. Nice, man. I have not heard of the book, so I'll have to check that out. You yeah. know, I'm an avid reader too. I got an extensive library at the house, so now I got another one to add. So I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. The Tools. Amazon, Ryan, the tools. Boom. Yeah. Let's ding it. Let's yeah. ding it. Yeah. Um, favorite food since you're a foodie. <laughs> oh, man. I grew up in Texas. My favorite food is Tex-Mex. You cannot get it here. So if we, Tex -Mex. if we, if we kind of like just try to replace that since I can't get it anymore, I love seafood, but, uh, you know, man, I'd say fusion, man. I've really been digging the, the fusion restaurants around the Tampa area. And there's, there's actually one in Dunedin, Fusion Street Eatery. Excellent. Yeah, I've been there. I can name it's a ton a of good restaurants in Dunedin, by the way. I don't mean to just shout out one, but no, go ahead. I love fusion. I love fusion food. Very cool. Um, favorite movie? Not a movie watcher, but let me think, man. If I go way back, I mean. I, or a TV show or character, something that uh, resonated with you. Yeah, I have a hard time with all this. Um, I don't really know where I would go with this. You know, back in the day, I liked. You know, we could like, skip it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I, I I read business books. I watch business uh, documentaries. You know, I like documentaries and stuff. And then, are I, you a, like I a seminar guy? Do you go to any business events? Yeah, like that? man. I'm I'm learning based. Everything I do is learning based. I'm constantly building on my education. I'm constantly building my network. Every, I'm always on. Is there a favorite seminar you've attended or something that you'd recommend? Uh, Ed Milet, man. I just saw him live. Holy Ed cow. Ed Milet, the there you go. About. He's, he's cool. He's funny. He's smart. He's driven. He's, you know, he's, yeah. Yeah, no was, doubt. That was incredible. I got to see him live. I was super impressed. Very cool. That's yeah. awesome. All right, man. We're going to wrap up. There's a lot of nuggets that we threw out there today, and I hope people can take something from this episode and apply it, and that's how we always end our episodes in just a second here. But one of the things that I think is always important is to, you know, they talk about the seven habits of highly successful people. The first one is to begin with the end in mind, right? Absolutely. And you think about what legacy you want to leave, whether that's through your family, your business. You mentioned your priorities in that order. God, family, I think it was, right? God, family, and then business, I guess, was the yeah. third. Yeah. Um, when you think about the legacy bill that you want to leave, you know, when, when, when you leave this earth one day, what's, what is that legacy that would be most important to you? that you hope you've left your stamp on and, uh, and you hope you're known for? You know, I mean, I just, I enjoy investing into others um, and, and coaching and mentoring and, and I enjoy learning. So I enjoy seeking out coaches and mentors. So being a great student and, and bring, being a great teacher, I think are two things that are important to me uh, all after God and family. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think it goes without saying, I want to be remembered uh, for my, for my beliefs, you know, uh, for being faith-based and for being, uh, you know, a family man. I think those are the most important things. But yeah, lastly, I want to just pour into others and help, you know, bring prosperity to as many people as possible. I always say I use BP all kinds of different ways. So my mission is be phenomenal in all that we do and bring prosperity to as many people as possible. So that's what I want to do. That's how I want to be. I love that mission, man. We also got a cool t-shirt on. I don't know we didn't throw that out there yet, but you can check it out if you can see that. Don't wait to buy real estate, buy real estate and wait, right? So that's the old investing investor, uh, um, uh, ad adage, right? So, yeah, and, and don't wait to get into real estate. You from know, a, get from into a business real estate, standpoint, yeah. Don't wait, you know, there, get into real estate and then go hard. <laughs> it, it ties into what you said earlier. Like sometimes you might have to leave that job in order to just dive right in. So it makes sense. Yeah. And you can build your own personal wealth off of this industry. Once you're in it, you're going to learn a lot more about the business. I think it's really important. People uh, understand that you don't get in here just to have a job. You don't get in here just to be able to sell houses and have an income that requires your time. What you're trying to do is to build true wealth through passive income. So use your industry to build that passive income. Amen. We can have a whole other podcast just on that. Yes, sir. I'll stop there. <laughs> so, there's a, I'll, I'll throw this out there though. I literally had a conversation yesterday with one, a friend of mine from this um, mastermind that I'm a part of called Front Row Dads. And there's a Very gentleman cool. in that group called, Kyle, his name is Kyle Reedstrom. You, can, you guys can Google him. And he has a great podcast. If you're into what you just said, it's called, um, uh, his podcast is called 
passive income 25K. I might have butchered the title, but it, that's the gist of it. And he has a whole podcast just about strategies of helping you build to 25K a month yeah. in passive income. Yeah. And we had a great conversation yesterday about just that and different things that he's doing, things that I want to be doing. And, and, and I wish we had a lot more time to dive into some of that I because know. we could have a whole conversation on that. But I love that, guys. Um, we're going to wrap up. To, it's, uh, we're running out of time here, but uh, as we always wrap up, there was a lot today that we dove into with Bill. Thanks for being here today, man. I know you added immense value. Uh, I hope that people feel the same way. And uh, what is one thing? I always want to leave you guys with this. What is one action? Just take one step today from something that you might have heard us talk about today. You know, maybe it's a simple buying the book on Amazon and, and starting that. Maybe it's just making a decision. Maybe you're somebody who has to decide to go all in and you're kind of held back for that. But what's one thing that you can do today to start creating the life that you want and, uh, and building the, uh, the business that you want on your terms? We're checking out Tampa Bay Real Producers. You can find us, of course, on any podcast platform. Subscribe anywhere you want. We'll see you on the next episode. Later.